Welcome. My name is Teacher Ibrahim. I teach biology. The reason as to why I came up with this online platform is to ensure that I impart the necessary biology skills to individuals who are yet to sit their exams and also for those individuals who feel like they want to increase their knowledge as far as biology is concerned. And definitely I believe that you're going to learn more as long as you're going to work together. Therefore, I wish to request you to like subscribe, watch the video, and if possible, press that notification bell so that in case I upload another new video, you will be able to view it. Good. Straight away, I would like us to get to the introductory part of biology, where we are going to look at the term biology, how it started, and what it stands for. Biology uh, was derived from two Greek words, that is bio and logos. Bio means life and logos means knowledge or study of therefore it generally deals with the study of life biology is defined as the branch of science that deals with the study of living organisms then the living, living organisms are so many on the surface of the earth including the atmospheric space and therefore these branches are divided into three major categories. Those three main branches of biology include zoology, the second one is botany, and the last one is microbiology. Zoology refers to the branch of biology that deals with the study of animals, while botany refers to the branch that deals with the study of plants. And lastly, microbiology deals with the study of those small microscopic organisms which can't be seen by the naked eyes. There are other major, uh, th there are other small minor branches of biology which we are also going to look at and the first one is parasitology parasitology refers to the study of parasites there is also another one which is referred to as anatomy this is the study of internal body structures while morphology is the study of external body structures we also have another one which is referred to as bio, uh, biotechnology Biotechnology is a branch of biology that deals with techniques which are meant to improve on uh, how biology is applied on the on to our daily lives. For example, biotechnology has enabled us to come up with some crop varieties which are having some advantages over the other natural ones such as those that are drought resistant including those that are no are uh, pest resistant they cannot be attacked by the pests we also have another branch that is referred to as embryology and that is the study of development uh, formation and development of an embryo we also have several other ones but i'm going to mention only three of them that is taxonomy taxonomy is the study of classification and in some books it will be written it is the science of classification but it still makes the same sense there is also another branch that is referred to as virology which is the study of viruses and lastly the branch of biology which is referred to as ornithology let me just write a spelling here ornithology is the study of bird and the last one is ichthyology this one is the study of fish i would like to get to another aspect where i'm going to talk about importance of studying biology 
Biology is very important to be studied because it enables an individual to get to know or to venture into some other careers such as dentistry, veterinary, agriculture, and many others. It also enables one to acquire some skills in uh, some skills which are useful in day-to-day -day life such as observation, recording, and analyzing. It also, enabled, it also enables an individual to understand the developmental stages in the human body and we'll talk about such kind of stages later on as we'll be looking at the process of development in the body of an individual. And lastly, biology is also important because it enables us to solve environmental problems such as pollution and uh, uh, food shortage. When there is a pollution in environment, we cannot live comfortably and therefore environment, environmental pollution can be eliminated by use of some techniques in biology whereby we will be able to uh, use some materials which are biodegradable, those that uh, meaning those that can be able to decompose in case they have been used up. It also enables us to get rid of those that cannot decompose. We call them non-biodegradable, such as the plastics and some other compounds which may be involving the heavy metals which are dangerous to the human life. I'd like us to now talk about the uh, characteristics of living organisms and these characteristics are eight in number. Let me just clear the board first before I write it here. An individual is capable of remembering all the nine, uh, all the eight characteristics of living organisms in a span of one second if you will be able to remember this simple acronym, Mr. Nigga. Let me write it here. This acronym will enable you to remember all the eight characteristics of living organisms, whereby the first one, the first letter here, letter M, stands for movement. Second letter, R, stands for respiration. Another letter here, N, stands for nutrition. Letter I, stands for irritability. Letter G, the first one, stands for gaseous exchange. Another G stands for growth and development. Letter E stands for excretion. And lastly, letter R stands for reproduction. This simple acronym, you can be able to remember it very easily because it is commonly used, especially in the US, whereby you can read, you can even hear someone saying the word, hey, Maniga, what's up? What are you doing here? That word, Mr. Nigga, can easily be remembered, and that is why I chose to use it as an acronym of enabling an individual to remember the eight characteristics of living organisms. Let's go through them and see what they stand for. The first one, movement. Movement refers to 
change in position by either part of the body or the entire body. But it can still be categorized into two, whereby the first one we can be having only some part of the body changing position, then that one is referred to as movement. But in case there is total change in position by the entire body, then that is referred to as locomotion. Then I think it is so clear to you that plants can move, but they cannot locomote. Since locomotion refers to the total change uh, in position by the whole body of an organism, then only animals are capable of locomoting. Therefore, it's quite definite that the parts of the body that they use for locomoting are referred to as the locomotory structures. And it's quite obvious that now human beings have the legs as their locomotory structures. What about the birds? Definitely they have both legs and the wings as the locomotory structures while small organisms such as Amoeba may use some kind of uh, locomotory structure such as the pseudopods. We come to see what pseudopods are. And the bacterial cell, its locomotory structure is referred to as cilia or flagella. Respiration. This is the process whereby food is chemically broken down to yield energy to the body of an individual while nutrition is the process whereby an individual is capable of acquiring and utilizing nutrients. When, uh, for example, an individual may drink some juice which contains some glucose in it and therefore this will be broken down in the body to yield energy. And during that process, we say that the food is being utilized within the body. Another one is referred to as irritability. Irritability is derived from the word irritate. And this is the ability of an organism to detect and respond to changes within their environment appropriately. For example, an individual gets into a room which is dusty, then that, is individual, that individual may end up sneezing or coughing. That process of sneezing is aided by some part of the body that is referred to as the diaphragm and some mucoid layer which is found on the surface of the trachea, that is the internal surface, which tends to wash out the dusty material and get rid of it. Therefore, we say that this organism's body detected the change and it has responded to it appropriately. Irritability can also be noticed when an individual maybe walks into a, a dusty road, then maybe some dusty particle get into the eye, the eye may end up secreting uh, some tears. There is a specific part of the eye which is referred to as the tear gland or the lacrimal gland that may end up secreting the tears. Upon secretion of the tears, there will be, uh, the tears will be able to wipe out the dusty particles and maintain the eye in its, uh, in its original state the way it was. Another one is referred to as gaseous exchange. Gaseous exchange is the process whereby living organisms allow passage of respiratory gases across the respiratory surfaces. For example, for the body of a human being, lungs are the respiratory surfaces. Then, therefore, these lungs will uh, take in, uh, will allow oxygen into the blood uh, or into the other tissues while they get out uh, carbon four oxide gas and therefore that one, that process through which these gases are moving in and out of the respiratory surfaces are refer is referred to as gaseous exchange therefore i say that gaseous exchange is the passage of respiratory gases across the respiratory surfaces the next one is referred to as growth and development growth 
is the irreversible change in the body size and mass. For example, when somebody grows tall, we say that that person is growing. It is said to be irreversible because once growth has occurred, then it cannot be reversed. For example, somebody cannot grow tall and later on the person grows dwarf once again. It's impossible and therefore we say that it is permanent. But for the case of development, now the development part is the qualitative aspect of growth whereby there is an increase in the mass of the body but, is, but it is reversible because somebody can grow the, uh, fat today but later on after some few months, some few weeks or years you find that this person has now grown thin. That is now we say that the person developed uh, some uh, some organs within the body develop some characteristics within the body that is basically increasing mass and later on it ends up reducing that is growth and development another one is excretion excretion is the removal of the metabolic waste products from the body when the metabolic waste products continues to accumulate within the body, they may lead to toxicity. Hence, an individual may become sick or end up losing life. The last one is reproduction. This is the process whereby an individual gives rise to another offspring of the same kind. And therefore, that marks the end of uh, looking at the characteristics of living organisms, then let us have a glance at something else whereby we are going to look at the uh, collection of specimens. During collection of specimens, there are some specimens which can be quite injurious to the biologist who is going to collect them from the field. And therefore, we need to have extreme care and precaution that will prevent us from being injured by those specimens that we are collecting. They include some dangerous insects such as ants, mosquitoes, among others, and even some other plants like the stinging nettle. There are four precautionary measures that each individual must also ensure that he is adhering to during the collection of this specimen. The first one being, you only need to collect the required number of these specimens. For example, you require only 10 grasshoppers. You will need to pick only the 10 grasshoppers and in case you have just picked more than the number, then you just know that you are now depleting the habitat. And during that process, you may also cause uh, some inconvenience to those individuals who also wanted maybe a bigger number that, than the one that you wanted. Then they come and find that you have just taken too much exceeding the number that you are going to use. Remember, these specimens, we define them as an organism or an, uh, an organism or an object that is used in the, bio in the experimental process during biology. We call it a specimen. Let's move on. There is also another precautionary measure which states that an individual should return these specimens back to their habitat if possible. Meaning if you are not killing that organism, then you can just pick it up, take it back to its original habitat where you got it from, then it will proceed with its own life. And also, we always remind individuals that during this process of collection of specimens, there are some that are harmful. Hence, you need to handle them with extreme care so as to avoid uh, being injured in any other way. Plants like the stinging nettle, the ant, mosquito, and uh, other insects may be injurious to the health of an individual and therefore they need to be handled with extreme care. Lastly, highly mobile organisms 
should be immobilized before being uh, picked from their habitat. Habitat, for example, if you have gone to pick the rat or mice, they are highly mobile, they move from one point to the other, and therefore it might be quite difficult for an individual to pick them from uh, their habitat. If, if so, you will need to use some chemical substances such as chloroform, let me write the spelling here, to immobilize it, uh, you can use tetrachloroethane, you can also use uh, diethyl ether to immobilize them. When that organism inhales this, uh, the gaseous form of this substance over here, then it will become unconscious. And once unconsciousness has been exhibited in that organism, it becomes so easy for you to now pick it, go with it to the lab and carry out your experiment or whichever kind of assay that you wanted to conduct. Then that makes it so simple and that makes the end of uh, this subtopic whereby we are looking at the precautionary measures that are taken when picking or collecting specimens for biological processes and therefore right now I would like us to look at the apparatus that are used for collection of specimens. The first apparatus right here as you can see it is referred to as the sweep net. Sweep net comprises of a handle and it also comprises of a net which is basically uh, made of mosquito net so as to prevent small organisms from escaping when <coughs> when they have been coll collected from their natural habitat. The second apparatus that I would like us to look at is referred to as the putter. Putter is a container which comprises of two tubes connected to it, and those tubes are meant for sucking insects from the barks of trees or from the rock surfaces. When you look at the structure of the puta, it also have a small net in it uh, attached to one of the tubes and that net is meant to prevent an individual who is sucking from sucking the dust and the insects which have already been collected. The function of the puta is to suck small insects from rock surfaces or the barks of trees. I uh, would also like to talk about the third apparatus which is referred to as the bait trap. Bait trap uh, comprises of a wire mesh around it which uh, prevent the animal from escaping once it has been trapped. The function of these apparatus is to trap small animals such as rats. As you can see, it has got an opening here within, into which an animal can get in trying to get to the bait so as to feed on it. Bait should therefore be some kind of food which that animal likes so that it can move in to try and consume it. The fourth one is referred to as a pair of forceps. A pair of forceps is used to collect small insects which could be injurious to the individual who is collecting them. Those uh, insects may include ants, scorpions, spiders, among others. Let's go to the fifth one here, which is uh, referred to as the pitfall trap. The pitfall trap is a bottle which is engraved into the soil and uh, it also have a lid on top of it. It is meant to trap small crawling insects which will now fall in and they cannot escape out. Then they are taken to the lab for uh, the experimental purposes. It also contains a lid on top of it which prevent rain from uh, falling into the container which can end up uh, endangering the life of the specimens before they are taken to the lab and it also prevents some substances such as stones from getting into the container. We also have the specimen bottles. Specimen bottles are of different sizes depending on the size of specimen which is being collected and they are used for 
storing and transporting specimens from their natural habitat to the lab upon collection. I would also like to look at the other one which is referred to as the fish net. This apparatus is used for collecting fish and some other aquatic organisms such as crabs and shrimps. It is also made up of a net which enables water to pass through and those organisms, uh, the small ones, do not pass through. Uh, the last one is referred to as a hand lens. A hand lens comprises of various regions, that is the handle and the convex lens in it. Uh, when you look at the structure of the hand lens, it is meant to uh, magnify small structures and organisms to make them larger enough so that they can easily be seen by the naked eyes. The convex lens is at the center most part of it and it also it is also made up of the frame which circles the, uh, the convex lens and the handle as well. During uh, the process uh, uh, when magnification is being done by use of the Hand, uh, hand lens, we will come up with some readings uh, where we can use the ruler to measure the object that is being uh, the object that is being uh, magnified by the hand lens, and the image that we'll be able to see. In case you draw it, definitely it's going to be bigger than the main object because object is always smaller. Then. If you will be able to measure that length, that one now becomes the drawing length. The length of the image that you have just drawn upon seeing it under the, the lenses. An object lens, uh, and the length of an object is referred to as the actual length. Therefore, we can be able to get magnification that was done by getting the drawing length and we divide it by the actual length and therefore we can come up with a formula here whereby we say that magnification is equals to drawing length over the actual length and for this case our drawing length was 8 centimeters and the actual length was 4 centimeters and therefore we can go ahead and say that magnification is equals 8 centimeters divided by 4 centimeters. If we cancel this out, then we end up with 2. Therefore, we can say that magnification is equals times 2. Always remember to give your magnification readings in form of times because it is implying that that image was magnified a number of times so that you can be able to see the way it is. Please do not use the measurement readings when you are referring to magnification. That marks the end of our first topic, that is introduction to biology. Thank you so much for watching the lesson and I'm very happy for that. I would also wish to request you to please remember to subscribe because we are yet to cover some more and I believe that there is more coming through your way. Thank you so much. We will meet in our next lesson where I'll be talking about the second topic in Form 1 that is Classification 1. Thank you so much.